everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you. What a day! <laughs> I'm uh, Pierre-Alix Binet, I'm Head of um, Strategic Development and uh, Institutional Relations at Finance for Tomorrow, and I will moderate this session. Before introducing um, my co-panelists, um, I've been asked to put this session into a little bit of context. Uh, I must uh, give you a few uh, words on why we decided to put the Just Transition uh, at the heart of our agenda and why we decided to uh, organize this session. We strongly believe at uh, Finance for Tomorrow that the climate challenge can be achieved only if made uh, socially acceptable. And very quick, I have a few elements on that. Uh, first of all, uh, social and uh, climate challenge uh, are linked and are, are we are facing these two challenges uh, at the same time. Social, uh, our societies um, become much more unequal than in the past. Uh, we are facing inequality uh, challenge and we see already its uh, political and economic uh, consequences. So we are facing uh, social and climate uh, challenge at the same time and this is a strong argument to link the two. My second element is when you try to address uh, the climate challenge, by definition you have social implications. Several studies, uh, the OECD for example, uh, but we have others, um, have shown that when you enter into a decarbonization um, uh, policy, you have a distributive impact that is important. Therefore, uh, we need redistributive policies at the policy level um, to, uh, to address the challenge and to make it possible. My third po point is when you, we, everybody here know the stranded asset, in the context of the climate challenge, um, we will see the progressive emergence of uh, uh, workers, uh, stranded, stranded workers, also of uh, sectors stranded. So, uh, meaning uh, by running uh, this kind of policy, um, we, uh, we see that some sectors will uh, be affected by it. And also, last uh, but not least, my fourth element, um, uh, when, um, in case of a, a very social, uh, uh, a very strong social turbulence, uh, the, um, uh, when you see uh, the strong social turbulence, the climate challenge will be much more difficult uh, to, to be achieved. For the transition to be accepted, um, it must be socially accepted. So we see the just transition as a real challenge and we need tools uh, to manage it. It was a red line in the 1919 for the Climate Finance Day, and it has been an issue uh, carried out since by the task force led uh, by Jean-Jacques Barberis and with uh, several financial players I see in the room uh, within Finance for Tomorrow. Um, and allow me to, put to, to say a few words on the coalition, on the Investors for a Just Transition coalition that uh, uh, Finance for Tomorrow had launched next June. Um, this global uh, investor engagement coalition uh, bring together asset owners, asset managers, along with corporates uh, to promote uh, just transition. We, we engage, uh, we want to engage uh, companies um, uh, in, the, in, the field, in the topic of a just transition. We will uh, launch a data hub and uh, we are concluding uh, an academic partnership with the Institut Louis Bachelier. And we will present all that uh, during the COP26. But now, for now, I have a very distinguished panel with me. So thank you very much to be here. Uh, we have on the screen Sarah Gordon. Uh, Sarah Gordon, you are the chief executive of the Impact Investing Institute, uh, which uh, launched in November 2019. Uh, your goal is to accelerate the growth and improve the effectiveness of the impact investment market in the UK but also internationally. Previously, you worked in fund management in the UK and uh, the US, and you spent 18 years uh, at the Financial Times. Uh, thank you to be here. Again with me, I have the pleasure to have Sabine Lockman. Um, you are the global head of uh, Moody's ESG measures and the president of VE. Uh, under these titles, you steer the VE's development strategy and the evolution of its uh, business model, as well as uh, assuming responsibility for uh, Moody's ESG data, analytics and scores. Uh, you are more than welcome. 
Uh, also with us, Gideon uh, Magara, you represent the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program, AIFP, an initiative whose goal uh, is to provide a quality training uh, in PPPs to uh, African civil servants working in the field of uh, infrastructure uh, procurement and delivery. So you are a PPP uh, legal officer at the Kenyan National Treasury, so you are welcome. And last but not least, um, oh sorry, uh, I, 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 I wanted to introduce Nick Robbins, but we have Bettina Rainbows. I'm ha very happy to introduce Bettina. Uh, you are Director of Human Rights and Social Issues at the PRI. So since 2016, you are overseeing and providing direction on strategic initiatives on social issues and the development of research, analysis and uh, guidance for investors across topics, including human rights, labor practices, in equality, social dimensions of climate strategies and diversity, to name a few. So thank you very, very much uh, to be with us. And uh, Nick Robbins, uh, we will have Nick Robbins in a concluding keynote at the end of the session. He will uh, join us later because he's uh, hosting a webinar in London on Just Transition. Um, but to, just to put in a nutshell, Nick joined the Grantham Research Institute among the London School of Economics in 2018 as professor in practice for sustainable finance. And the focus of his work is on how to mobilize finance for climate action in ways uh, that support a just transition. So, thank you very much. Um, for the first set of questions, we, we can uh, get right in the, in the debate. Uh, Bettina, do you hear me? Yes. So, so as Hello, we have everyone. just seen uh, in the introduction, Just Transition is an emerging uh, topic uh, which uh, responds to an essential, essential issue. Relatively early on, the PRI launched the reflection on the concept of Just Transition. Uh, in 2018, they published, uh, you published a guide for investor action that you update several times uh, and a very aspiring guide. Uh, their main, your main point is to say that uh, investors can make an important contribution as stewards of assets, allocators of capital and uh, as influential voices in public policy to make sure that the transition produces inclusive and sustainable development. So just a quick question to start. Uh, why should investors care about Just Transition? Great, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, so it all started, as you mentioned, back in 2018, where we teamed up with the IRI at Harvard Kennedy School in the US, um, the Grantham Institute at London School of Economics here in the UK, and also the International Trade Union Confederation um, to really you know, come up with action plans for how do we tackle this concept of just transition, which back then was relatively nascent. I mean, it's always been part of the Paris Agreement, but, you know, taking this a little bit more into action. And we then developed this uh, investor guide that's intended to be a very practical piece of, of um, guide for investors with your asset owners, investment managers, service providers, of how do you really apply um, this to the to the investors and what role can investors play. So it's since 2018 been translated to both French, uh, Spanish and Italian. And alongside um, the guide as well, we launched something we call the Investor Expectation Statement, um, which has been signed by 163 investors uh, who collectively represent 10 trillion uh, US dollars in assets under management. So quite a big um, chunk of it. And, you know, to your question of why is, is the just transition an increasing imperative for investors as part of their climate strategies, you know, it's very clear. Um, there's a need to have a strong social component from the get-go, or otherwise we're going to have a lot of issues mitigating and uh, remedying unintended social implications that these commitments will bring along. Um, for example, thinking about kind of negative human rights impacts of renewable energy uh, plans and companies on the communities, or even often the, the concept that green jobs um, that are being created aren't necessarily always decent jobs. So it's really the need to bring in that social aspect there. And, you know, every investment has either had negative or positive impacts. Um, so this will really help apply that to the climate transition and really understand um, also the interconnectedness of, of the two pressing agendas of climate change on one side, but also human rights and the agenda there, which we've also highlighted um, through our expectations last year, to really see those interconnectedness of those two pressing ag uh, agendas and to understand that, you know, we need, you know, with 
understand which are the stakeholders you need to um, to involve in setting up climate action strategies, both for companies and for investors. You know, you need the need for worker representatives, communities, and consumers to be consulted, and also beneficiaries um, to be to have their say um, to make sure that everyone is on board. So it's really not, you know trying to connect those two dots. And I think that's what the Just Transition Agenda is really doing, is connecting the links across the two um, to kind of see it much more holistically for, for institutional investors. Thank you very much. So, Gideon Magara, one of the central elements of the Just uh, Transition is to consider the particularity of the territories. For example, emerging count economic countries face uh, the undeniably uh, huge task to transition their economies to be cleaner and more sustainable. This transition, however, will impact jobs in fossil fuel-based energy production and could, if not considered from a social perspective, negatively impact millions of indi individuals. The question arises in a certain way for emerging countries that have uh, high levels of poverty and uh, growing uh, unemployment. So if we take the example of Kenya, if we take the example of Kenya, Kenya is a global uh, player, often leading part uh, in various international discussions um, linked uh, to the pressing uh, issues of climate uh, change and uh, sustainable development. So how to pursue uh, a just transition in Kenya, but also how to achieve a just transition in emerging economies? Well, thank you very much, Pia. Um, um, it gives me great pleasure, um, indeed quite a privilege, uh, to appear in the same panel with uh, very good minds like Sarah, Sabine, uh, Bettina, and I was expecting Professor Robbins, but I understand the impairment. Um, I would like also, in a very special way, just before I proceed with addressing that very singular question, I would like to thank very much all the fellows of the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program, uh, on whose honor and privilege that I have the benefit to speak to you before. Um, I'd like to recognize Mr. Thierry Dew, the president of the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program, together with the Global Infrastructure Hub, Meridian, and the World Economic Forum for putting the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program together. So on to Straight to your point, <clears throat> uh, Pierre, you have stated the, 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 the context very correctly. Uh, how, do we, um, how do we address a just transition uh, in a country, in an emerging country like Kenya, which is characterized by massive unemployment? Well, the fact remains that a country like Kenya, an emerging country, is faced with massive employment. Um, I do not think that a just transition will cause the massive disruption uh, characterized by things like unemployment. Um, and I will explain. So the question that uh, you have raised, Pia, it's quite fundamental, which is how do we achieve, how do we achieve a just transition in an economy like Kenya? I want to, first of all, paint a bit of context and talk about the Kenyan situation. So Kenyan ratified the Paris Agreement in 2016, and like most emerging countries in Kenya, it enacted a raft of national climate change action plans, which are deeply anchored in the Kenyan Vision 2030 blueprint program, uh, and also aligned to the government's Big Four agenda. Uh, the Big Four agenda has four key pillars, which is food security, affordable housing, uh, he universal health for all, and uh, job creation and manufacturing. It's the last pillar that I want to talk about, and I want to talk about the last pillar of job creation, of course, within the broader context of a just transition. <clears throat> so an offshoot question therefore arises here from your broader question. How do we address employment within the just transition in a country like Kenya where there is a massive fear that a just transition will cause unemployment? It is a very fundamental question and one that you have to look at from the backdrop of the COVID-19 situation, which has brought a lot of economic, social and health unprecedented crisis. I don't think it's an easy question to address and even listening to the keynote address today, but I carry with me a very strong message from the fellows of the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program. And the message is as follows. 
To address a just transition, there are key things that need to be addressed. Uh, number one, I think a proper just transition will require time. A proper just transition will require inclusivity, very important. It will require definitely resources, but most importantly, it will require proper planning. So to understand what happens really in emerging economies, one really needs to understand what really happens at the grassroots levels, at the villages uh, where people uh, barely survive with less than a dollar per day. Uh, people are faced with uh, massive problems, including dying of diseases that can be easily preventable. People are living in squalid conditions. So to these people, a just transition might not make sense unless you include them in the proper planning of the process. So the proper planning entails, uh, as I have said, a massive of things. It requires dialogue. It requires a lot of dialogue with the communities, with the civil society organizations that have massive interface with the communities at the grassroots levels. It requires proper planning and social dialogue with the business communities, and it requires a progressive realization of the just transition. There is never a one-size-fits-all solution. However, engaging the communities in designing the, solu the, in designing the solutions for transitioning to a regenerative economies will achieve the greatest achievement. For me, a just transition for all, which puts people and the communities, is central. So the people need the education, and for this education, they need to be empowered and they need the resources. I think it's a good point as I look forward and as many of us look forward towards COP26 to remind us of the commitments that were made in COP21. We need their 100 billion United States dollars that were committed in COP21 to be dispersed to the emerging economies. It is with that resources that we can achieve a just transition. Thank you very much, Pierre. Thank you, Gideon. Sarah, Sarah Gordon, as we, we can see, the just uh, transition is a key concept emerging uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, in fact, the Impact Investing Institute is piloting the work carried out uh, within the framework of the G7 Task Force on the Impact, of uh, which Workstream B is working on the formalization of a framework on uh, just transition. So, Sarah Gordon, could, uh, could you tell us more? I certainly could, Pierre Halix, but um, and first of all, I just wanted to say thank you very much for having me on this panel. It's a great pleasure to be here with Bettina, Gideon and Sabine, it's, and, and particularly in fact with Gideon because Kenya was the last country that I visited before the pandemic. And um, I'm extremely sad not to be with you all in person in Paris. Um, I, I'm sure I'm sure Bettina shares my, my regret, but I'm very sorry to be um participating only virtually. Um, the, as, as you said, Pierre Helix, the G7 Impact Task Force has a very big focus on the just transition. And it has that focus for a lot of the reasons that Bettina and Gideon have talked about, that without a transition that is just and inclusive, there simply will not be the public backing that's necessary for the huge changes that that transition requires. So we really believe that there has to be a far wider embracing and understanding of the just transition concept for because otherwise the transition is simply not going to happen. And I was very interested to hear what Gideon was saying about the, the, the factors, the elements that he thinks um, are so important for a just transition because they align very closely to what we're doing in the G7 Impact Task Force, where indeed Kenya and a number of um, a number of sub-Saharan African countries are represented, and that issue about it's not just time, resources, proper planning, as Gideon said, but also critically inclusivity, and we have developed a set of practical tools um, to help make the just transition real. So that's to help policymakers, whether they're in the G7 or outside the G7, institutional investors, development finance institutions, multilateral development banks. It's really to help provide them with the practical tools that they need 
either to integrate a just transition, the just transition concept into their policy making and planning, or as an investor, how you integrate just transition into your um, investment strategies and approaches and your financing vehicles and the design and implementation of those financing vehicles. And we, we've really got, the, the work has been driven by uh, really two core beliefs. Um, and one is that um, this is only, it is only through collaboration uh, that we're going to achieve any kind of transition. It's why it's lovely to be on a stage today, even albeit virtually with other organisations that are working so hard. We're all working towards the same end. If we don't have more and more of that collaboration between different organizations across the, within countries but but critically across the globe that transition is not going to happen and that's why the task force is a good thing because it's got a, more than 100 people from um, a, a huge variety of, of of countries and organizations represented there we have to work together but the second um sort of guiding principle really has been that the just transition is not just about climate action, socioeconomic equity and distribution, but also the critical third element is community voice. And that is the involvement and the integration of the people who are affected, um, whether it's by the transition, by, by climate change itself or by the financing vehicles that are being designed, their voices must be integrated both at the design stage and at the implementation stage for any just transition to actually be inclusive and fair. And one of the things that we're working on is really trying to help policymakers and institutional investors see what does that look like in practice. Because there is, we all know on this panel, and I'm sure in the room in which you all are, that there is a lot of talk, there are pledges, there are commitments. I mean, Gideon referred to the financial commitment that was made at COP21, which has not been fulfilled. So, you know, we are, we are all about at the Impact Investing Institute providing practical tools to actually deliver on those commitments. So what does that mean? That means that in December, we will have a... Um, a set of uh, documents and tools which will, number one, enable policymakers to really um, integrate that just transition concept with those three legs, those three elements, climate action, socioeconomic equity and distribution and community voice into their thinking, into their decision making. We also hope very much that there will be influential um, uh, action by the share governments, which are the shareholders in their development finance institutes, institutions, to really embed this concept of the just transition into the mandates of those development finance institutions so that they are committed not just to using their, uh, their, 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 their investment um, know-how and, and, and uh, firepower towards a just transition, but critically to work more effectively with private sector capital, with institutional investment, to mobilise more, much more capital at scale for a just transition. And finally, to have um, tools for institutional investors, and those will be blueprints of just transition financing vehicles across a range of asset classes, which really... Um, investors will be able to take away, they'll be able to replicate, they'll be able to integrate. Everything that we're doing in this task force is meant to be guiding, encouraging, supporting these all these different actors who all have to act. Um, thanks, Pierre Halix. Back to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. S Sabine, uh, Sabine Lockman, financial players often highlight the, la the lack of uh, reliable uh, data to put in place just transition strategies. Also, we often hear that uh, one of the key challenges of the, on the just uh, transition is a lack of uh, methodology. On the question of reporting, uh, we see the absence of uh, legislation and standards precisely on this point. What do we have about reporting on the subject of uh, just transition and how do you address the challenge of uh, just transition data? 
Thank you, Pierre Alex, and um, joining um, everyone uh, to uh, not only thanks for the panel which is organized today, but also for that uh, opportunity to face a pretty difficult challenge uh, and to go uh, somewhere beyond the talk, but what the talk. And I think uh, it's very important and critical that we all uh, gather and unify somewhere our efforts to uh, walk the talk. Um, perhaps before jumping into uh, my answers, I uh, just want to kindly remind everyone that when we're dealing with Just Transition as EAG Agency, uh, with Visio Aris Moody's EAG, we are beyond everything which is related to environmental and climate uh, risk assessment. Uh, we do assess social and labor uh, force assessment. And actually, this is um, something which started almost 25 years ago uh, when Nicole Nota was launching Visio Aris um, early in 2000. Uh, because uh, on the 38 indicators, uh, half of them are related to social uh, communities and uh, uh, labor uh, force. And when we're targeting the just transition uh, um, uh, framework, uh, actually we've got a, a third of them. And I just want to give some example because uh, it's a way to uh, share about what does exist um, and which is also related to what you were saying, uh, um, uh, Rebecca. Uh, because more than ever, uh, what we are using to assess uh, the just transition is uh, what is called a dual materiality, where we are working not only to assess within uh, the corporate uh, how they are dealing with ESG agencies, but all ESG uh, uh, risks, sorry, but also outside within the communities, the different relevant stakeholders, how um, we're and they are dealing with the um, uh, EAG risks uh, and assessment. So some criteria we're using to assess uh, that framework, for instance, responsible management of reorganization, because yes, when we have to deal with uh, energy transition, uh, huge transformation uh, within uh, business operating model, we'll have to manage um, you know, uh, the uh, education, learning, uh, change at the competencies level within the organization, but also to prepare either the new jobs to be put in place, but also how it will impact the people who won't uh, stay in the company because uh, either there is no more job or they are not willing or they can't deal with the new jobs and how we are going to deal with them in order to equip them uh, to live uh, a, a new working um, uh, or a new career outside of the corporation. Uh, everything which is also related to uh, green products and services, um, so really a social um, uh, uh, a very uh, important social uh, criteria. Um, and behind that, we've got also atmospheric emission and how it is dealt with, uh, again, uh, uh, the uh, promotion of the social and economic development and uh, other uh, key uh, you know, criteria to assess the just transition within EAG uh, evaluation. We have good data today, but we need to have uh, more uh, than good data. Uh, we need to have more than average data. Uh, everyone is uh, regularly saying that um, this, you know, we don't have, uh, we can't measure uh, social uh, data. Um, it doesn't exist, which is not true. Uh, I can tell you that our data scientists, our system, and our analysts, they are analyzing a million of data which are coming through the social um, criteria uh, in order to support a much more granular, comparable and uh, transparent data we can provide to investors, uh, but also to uh, you know, um, development banks, for instance, or even to corporate when they have to deal with um, that transition at their agenda. I want to say also that even if um, it isn't science-based, but yes, we do have reference texts like the uh, UN guiding principles, you know, uh, which are addressing businesses and uh, human rights. Uh, the ILO uh, fundamental principles also, uh, which are uh, broadly addressing, but also with very specific approach, uh, some of the social um, elements which are super important when we're talking about the just transition. And last but not least, uh, and I guess we were all amazed uh, when we moved through uh, the past 18, 24 months, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, social issues really jumped on the top of the pile, you know, uh, of the boardrooms uh, and pushing or helping 
uh, the decision makers, uh, but also the governance to better support management and reporting uh, to deal with that uh, critical and strategic uh, objective, which is not to leave anyone out of the growth plan, uh, because we can assess that, yes, there is a growth, growth plan we want to move through, but it has to be inclusive uh, and also to uh, welcome innovative solutions so that as much as we can, and this is our responsibility as decision makers, executive, politic, politician, uh, not to leave anyone out of the road. So we, we saw that uh, there are several avenues for an investor to make a positive contribution to a just transition. So investment strategies, engagement, capital allocation, policy dia dialogues, data strategies. So which, which ones, Sarah Gordon, uh, do you see as most impactful and are there quick wins that investors should focus on? Um, I, I mean, I don't think that there is any one single actor out of that group that you mentioned uh, that has a, a, a singular responsibility. I think all actors have responsibilities and opportunities. I mean, um, Mark Carney talks about, you know, who is advising, former governor of the Bank of England and advising the UK government in the run-up to um, COP, uh, obviously starting next week, um, that the climate crisis is the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. And in many ways, when you talk about a just transition, it feels quite uncomfortable to talk about the huge commercial opportunities that it, that it presents. But that is the reality. You know, this is about making a future fit, sustainable economy um, as much as anything else. And to that, to that end, there is a role and an opportunity and a responsibility for all the different actors in that. I mean, of the of the different groups that you've specified, I mean, we feel that it's incredibly important, particularly for the G7 countries to, um, as, as Gideon pointed out, live up to their responsibilities in terms of transfer of resources to finance a just transition. And I think that that has become even more imperative because of the pandemic and the um, enormous social inequities and lack of resilience that that has highlighted across the globe. But I also think there are great opportunities for institutional investors and for um, public grant or concessionary capital providers as well. And one of the things that we're really um, very excited about, and I know that this is something that you at, um, at Finance for Tomorrow are also thinking very actively about, is the opportunities for those different capital owners and managers to work together in much more innovative and scalable ways. And I think that, you know, that, that possibility, the possibilities for blended finance solutions in climate and socioeconomic um, uh, outcomes uh, delivery is really encouraging. What we've seen, I mean, the pandemic has been so terrible for, for everybody, but what it has done is, I suppose it's reawakened our recognition of, um, the, of humanity's immense capacity for innovation. And we've actually seen this in the financial world as well as in the health world, that um, you, know, you now have a number of really innovative financing structures where you've got commercial capital providers or managers working with, for example, the World, with the World Bank or the World Wildlife Fund or um, different sort of multilateral or NGO um, actors working together in financing structures, delivering outcomes, which are delivering both a financial return and just transition outcomes. And I think we, what we need to see is we need to build on the work of those that, that, that it's still pioneering, really, build on that work so that we are mobilising capital at far greater scale um, than it is currently being mobilised at. Because, you know, the, the, the opportunity set is huge. I mean, we've got, um, you know, the, the, the pot of capital available um, internationally. You know, we're looking at well over $154 trillion dollars. Um, mobilizing even small amounts, small percentages of that capital more effectively towards a just transition um, would be extremely effective, extremely um, impactful. So the work that we're doing within um, the task force, as I talked about earlier, is all about demonstrating what good looks like, demonstrating best practice, demonstrating things that can be replicated or copied or built on by institutional investors, 
by emerging market um, capital providers, by governments in the G7 and outside, and by the multilateral banks and development finance institutions. So I think there are huge opportunities there for quick wins in, for all those actors. Thank you very much, Sarah. As we said before, Gideon, you are a member of the IFP. This initiative whose mandate is to, to bring together governments and private sector uh, infrastructure professionals, academics, development banks and international organizations, infrastructure experts to create a network of uh, practitioners. And in this context, investors as uh, multilateral development uh, banks are key players in financing a transition to uh, net zero economies. Uh, facilitating uh, private investments in the context of the just transition is essential. Uh, there are many ways in which uh, they can and must uh, contribute to ensuring uh, that this transition is just uh, and uh, that it works uh, towards reducing social and economic inequalities and through regular dialogue with company. So, from a, div a multilateral development bank, how to address the just transition issues? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, and I think uh, I would like to pick up from uh, where where Sarah left, uh, uh, which is talking about the role of MDBs really when it comes to addressing the all um, the all uh, um, uh, phenomena of a just transition and their very specific role. Um, I think there are very good things to talk about when it comes to the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program. Uh, and I could talk about many, but key among them is the fact that uh, we've had an opportunity as fellows to interact with practitioners uh, in that masterclass where we are. And we've gotten to learn the role of MDBs specifically when it comes to climate finance and especially in emerging economies. I think it's important for me to mention um, a few of you, a very, very good things that are going on in uh, Africa, for example. I know the World Bank is doing a very good job in Mozambique through their finance uh, carbon partnership facility to disperse around 50 million US dollars by the year 2024 to support reducing of emissions from deforestation. I know in my own country, uh, Kenya, the African Development Bank has stopped financing a very big coal power plant, and I think it's a step in the right direction in addressing uh, the just transition and also climate finance. Uh, and while all these good examples are worth pointing out, I think uh, more can and should be done. I think uh, a lot can be done. Uh, and one of the things um, that I see when it comes to the whole collaborating uh, aspect between the private and the uh, public sector is accelerating finance in public-private partnerships by the MDBs. The MDBs need to come out very strongly and support the private sector, supporting the private sector in making sure that there are proper incentives for the private sector to build resilient and uh, green infrastructures. Um, it's also an opportunity for MDBs to proactively engage the civil society organizations in formulating environmental policies for a just transition towards a cleaner, renewable path. The other thing that is very challenging, and I would like to talk from experience working in the Public-Private Partnerships Directorate of the Ministry of Finance in Kenya, is there's a lot of hardships when it comes to project preparatory, and especially right now uh, with the whole emerging thing of ESGs. I think it's impo very important for MDBs to assist public authorities in the preparatory work and to make sure, and in project preparation, just to make sure that preparatory work indeed addresses the climate impact of every project. Um, and also, there is um, a need, a felt need, for the MDBs to assist public authorities uh, when it comes to enacting very robust legal and regulatory frameworks. And not just assisting with the financing, but also assisting with the technical expertise and assisting with capacity building. Okay, thank you very much. I get the opportunity to, to say that we will organize a side event during the COP26 finance for tomorrow, we'll organize a side event uh, on uh, just transition and the role of uh, development, uh, multilateral development bank and just transition on the 5th of November. Um, 
Sabine Lockman, you've been a, a partner uh, for a very short time of uh, the Investors for a Just Transition Coalition that I, I mentioned in my introduction. Uh, this uh, coalition addresses the subject of data, holds an academic share, and coordinates an engagement uh, strategy. Many of uh, these aspects will be unveiled, uh, unveiled at the COP26 in a few days. Uh, can you tell us more, and uh, especially, what are you going to do in this coalition? Yeah, but not too much because I'm not here to launch it. But uh, yeah, earlier this summer, uh, in June 21, uh, Finance for Tomorrow um, launched that investors for a just transition uh, with a, a clear uh, goal to gather investors uh, to make that engagement coalition uh, to promote a socially acceptable transition uh, to low carbon economies. And uh, what is remarkable, uh, it is that uh, coalition is not only gathering, of course, asset managers, asset uh, owners, but also uh, join forces with companies, trade union, um, labor uh, representatives, association, and uh, um, data providers uh, to ensure a real multi-stakeholder dialogue, uh, being also inclusive with, and this is super important, uh, with the public sector and uh, representative from uh, Minister of Finance. Um, to really uh, move ahead uh, following uh, three um, you know, main action points. The first one is about encouraging uh, companies to integrate the just transition into their environmental strategy, their just transition strategy, um, uh, in, in and with a regular dialogue with uh, investors, and I would say with also data providers. I think it's critical uh, that at corporate le level, at issuers level, there is that engagement uh, with us, um, I want to say all data providers, okay, uh, because it's super important to understand what and why is, uh, what is behind uh, the EAG criteria and to really engage on, again, I'm repeating, but it is so critical to improve the way to report about what makes sense accordingly to our EAG assessment. Uh, report um, some data which are granular enough and uh, comparable enough so that we can really uh, build, uh, especially when there is no standard yet existing, and also engage uh, to really, um, especially when we'll have to uh, assess uh, how they are dealing with stress transition framework. Uh, I was mentioning, for instance, uh, you know, uh, reorganization or redundancy plan. Um, it is perfectly something uh, a board, not a board of directors, but ex executive directors have to make a decision about launching a redundancy plan. The whole uh, question is not about launching that redundancy plan, but how can we anticipate in order to avoid as much as possible to leave anyone out of a career uh, um, plan. The second it is how to work uh, globally spoken within the communities in order to anticipate uh, the effect and the impact uh, of that redundancy plan. And last but not least, how to learn from that redundancy plan uh, also to enhance, um, you know, part of the social, but also at the governance level, some of the, um, um, you know, criteria which are uh, supportive to the uh, EAG assessment. The second uh, main action point is about promoting the best practices. Sarah was mentioning that, um, which is so important. Best practices, not only uh, within a corporate, uh, with a proper uh, leading uh, policy about how to deal with, for instance, energy transition plan, but also how it is enforced, you know, months after months, quarter after quarter, semester after semester, how uh, the corporate is also dealing in terms of best practice again with the reporting uh, about the results, even and when uh, they are not that good, but uh, on an agile mode, um, the corporate uh, is evolving, also benefiting from you know, discussion within professional organization, for instance, in order to promote best practice at a sector level. And the third uh, main action point is really about uh, facilitate the collaboration uh, between investors and businesses. Uh, because, um, you know, I'm just uh, back to um, uh, the keynote which was made um, by the person representing ENG. Uh, you can't launch uh, SLL, SLB, for instance, without uh, a proper interaction uh, with uh, banks, intermediaries, etc. But also being knowledgeable at uh, CFO level, for instance, uh, that that kind of tool do uh, exist and they can finance uh, their transition uh, because of these tools. And I can tell you that many of the CFO uh, I'm, I'm uh, regularly meeting, they don't know yet uh, about these tools. And I think 
there is um, an emergency in terms of uh, communication or communicating about um, these uh, kind of products. Lastly, uh, but very important because it's part of our engagement in terms of or as a data provider is really uh, not only to embrace that um, you know, work within the coalition, uh, we consider it's part of our responsibility uh, as a responsible actor, uh, but also to uh, contribute with the different market participants. Um, and I would say in-house in France, in Europe, but also benefiting from how we're dealing within uh, the world because of our uh, activities and uh, the offices we have all over the places uh, just to bring uh, in that coalition the best uh, in order to support a fair uh, transition. Thank you so much. So if you are an uh, asset owner, asset manager or any uh, company, don't uh, you are invited to become a, a member of this coalition. Um, Bettina Rainbows, Bettina, the just transition is an issue that has uh, had already been addressed uh, at the COP21 and the issue has become major at several times as uh, the COP24 uh, in Poland, for example. How do you see the development of the concept at the COP26 and what could uh, come of it? Great, thank you. Um, I think just linking on to what my fellow panelists have been saying already, I think, you know, we have seen a lot um, happen since we released the guide back in 2018 and a lot on kind of investor actions across different um, levers. You know, it's great to hear about this um, alliance from Finance for Tomorrow. We very much welcome that and kind of that collaboration between stakeholders, I think, is very, very keen and really using that leverage, especially the, the leverage and influence investors have to kind of use that creatively of think, okay, how do we really approach this? This is something that's a new topic. You know, how do we kind of think a little bit outside the box um, to ensure that we bring that forward? So just to say, um, you know, from, from when this was launched in 20, uh, in, in the first COP21, you know, it was included, I think, in COP24 um, in Katowice, there was a whole Silesian declaration really pushing just transition much more at the forefront, getting this really up on the agenda um, to kind of say, okay, we're, we're moving, we're understanding the concept, we need, now need to move into action and how do we really um, kind of, how do we do this in practice, right? Like, how do we actually, as investors, engage with companies on this? That's where you know Sabine's point around the methodology and the, and the data that shouldn't stop us because there is a lot of data we just need to understand how we use that data and make it meaningful as well and not just make this a reporting exercise but actually really uh, draw on that so you know and we've seen great examples of, of investors kind of trying to take that into action whether it's stewardship activities um, you know with engagement conversations and we're really seeing some positive developments now alongside the climate action 100 plus um, initiative that also is actually, re, they've revised the just transition indicators to flesh that out a little bit more, to more meaningfully capture um, the kind of performance of the companies assessed. And, and then obviously the developments we see also with the World Benchmarking Alliance um, around their just transition assessment methodology. So, you know, the stewardship side, the policy um, conversation, I think that's really what we're hoping to see from COP26 this year as well. You know, is that we we have kind of expectations both for governments on really that you know committing to a just transition. So and and governments can really do this by collaborating on just transition plans, as we discussed earlier. Which really these plans need to be with workers and communities reliant on the fossil fuel sector, but also other um, industries that might be um, you know transitioning for a low carbon future. Um, and really have that meaningful social dialogue uh, with trade unions and workers as set out in ILO guidelines uh, for just transition, but also ensuring equitable distribution um, of access to energy and climate solutions at an affordable price, right? We're talking to Gideon's point, like this is, we need to think about the real world outcome here at the end of the day. And we're talking about how people are actually affected by this. So really bringing that into the conversation of climate strategies um, and also ensuring that the climate solutions that are coming up and um, various kind of finance mechanisms, um, that they really also have effective social safeguards in place um, and independent grievance mechanisms. Um, as well as human rights due diligence in place to really kind of as a fundamental piece in line with um, the OECD guidelines and also the UN guiding principles on business human rights. And just lastly, in terms of our, our call for our investment communities and investors for COP26, we're hoping for kind of a bolder action, I guess, a bolder, bolder and clearer action and commitment. Um, you know, we call on all investors to really take that holistic approach that I mentioned in my introductory remarks 
on climate, um, integrating nature, deforestation, but really also the social implications and really bringing those two agendas together. Um, you know, and, and as we talked about, you know, ensuring that transition plans have human rights consideration, that climate solutions respect affected communities, not just about reskilling people um, and, and kind of the, the workforce, but also around that auxiliary um, communities and how they're impacting the whole local economy around this. Um, and also just we need to see more more investor action on on the concept of just transition, you know, really across the different investor levers from stewardship activities, as I mentioned, to policy engagement and more importantly, also asset allocation. How do you really integrate this into your investment decision making um, to really bring out also more place based initiatives? I think we're all aware that a just transition is very dependent on the specific locale uh, and locality of it. So how do you really bring that in? Um, and key to that, obviously, is that collaboration that Sarah also mentioned earlier across the stakeholders with governments, with other investors, with businesses, you know, the whole kind of um, kind of economy wide side to really try and say we, we need to act on this in a way that's constructive and, you know, maybe creative in how we're approaching it. But really with that outcome um, of understanding that we're delivering a, a kind of future that, you know, can't leave anyone behind. And I think, as the other panelists have also said, you know, COVID was a sharp reminder of really bringing the social issues in, in focus and really highlighting the need um, that if we are going to, you know, be resilient to shocks and climate change is one long one, you know, we really need to be well prepared and it's about actually being resilient and thinking forward um, about it. Thank you very much. And in a, in a short, uh, in a few words, because the time flies, um, and this is a question very linked to, to, to this one, to this answer. Um, what would you like to see happen uh, at COP26 COP in terms of, uh, of the transition? And uh, I ask uh, this question for each participant. Sabine. Yeah, when I <clears throat> listen to um, the experts and other uh, organizations uh, and agree that should ambition uh, be ratched up at COP uh, on what we need to do, the demand for more action on social disruption will be immediate, uh, not for the future. Uh, and if, on top of that, we factor in physical impacts uh, of climate becoming more frequent and severe, which is much more than real, the, the social dislocation uh, will be even greater. This will demand strong uh, and anticipated just transition action uh, from all sides. And this is what I'm expecting from Great. the <laughs> participants. Big challenge. <laughs> Big challenge. <laughs> Gideon? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> um, I would like to rehash um, my expectation that I alluded to a while back, uh, which is I would like to see a, re a reaffirmment of the commitments by the developed countries on uh, the commitments that they made in COP21, basically. Um, I would also like to see more dialogue. Um, this should be uh, discussion beyond COP26 on the just transition theory and the whole broader framework of a climate change. Uh, I think it matters when people talk about these things. It matters a lot. Um, I just want to remind all of us that COVID pandemic taught us that we must listen to science. Uh, climate change is such a very important issue to be left to scientists and engineers alone. We have to take a role in it. We have to talk about COVID pandemic and not just COVID pandemic, but also climate change, because indeed it's the defining issue of our time. And finally, I just want to remind all of us uh, what the late Professor Wangari Mathai said a few years ago. Um, and I quote, and she said that it's the little things the citizens do. That's what will make the difference. My little thing is planting trees. Our little thing today, in my perspective, is talking about just transition. Of course, there are many other people who are doing many other big things. I thank you for sharing this platform. And just like Professor Ongari Mathai, I just want to say that it's our little thing to talk about just, just transition, but it goes a long way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, b uh, sorry, Sarah Gordon, do you have a few words on the COP26? 
Yes, um, as well as my the little things that I will do, um, Gideon. Um, I, I would like to see a very explicit commitment to a just transition coming out of COP, um, both by the parties at COP, but also a very explicit commitment to the institutions and the investment that that requires. On the institutional front, um, Nick uh, Robbins, who's just joined us, I see, and I have been an, part of a number of organisations calling for the UK to establish a national just transition commission. I'd love the UK to do that, and I'd love other countries uh, to also... Um, I mean, some already have. Scotland has a just transition commission already, but I would love to see that institutional commitment to a just transition and to making it happen. And I would like to see um, genuine, um, genuinely the investment put behind those commitments that the just transition requires, and specifically for the just transition in the emerging markets. And to echo and repeat Gideon's um, plea, uh, which, you know, is if, if this was the one thing that came out of COP, this would be an enormous step forward, actually meeting the commitment the financing commitment that was that was made back at COP21. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And Bettina, would you like to add something? Just to, to um, stress what I just mentioned as well, but I agree with all the other panelists, really just that bold action. Like we have the commitment, actually let's make this into real action and really integrate the social considerations into that climate change um, strategy and thinking to really see the holistic picture. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Is Nick Robbins connected? Yes. Oh, you are, <laughs> you are on my back. Sorry, now I see you in front of me. So uh, we're lucky to have Nick Robbins online. Nick, you are the expert of uh, Just Audition and you have accepted to conclude this session. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much and sorry for joining you lately. Uh, we've been organizing this week with a number of partners, the PRI, the ITUC, um, and uh, our colleagues at Harvard uh, and many others, are what we're calling our Just Zero event, um, which is really trying to gather some of the excitement, I think, that is across the financial sector. Um, and I think from what I've heard um, has come across from uh, Bettina and Sarah and Gideon and Sabine. So. I think what is uh, clear with a few days left to COP is that we have a very, very positive momentum. Uh, I think as we're agreed, just transition is nothing new. Uh, we have strong foundations uh, at the ILO in terms of just transition guidelines within the Paris Agreement. And I think we should all see the just transition for finance institutions about Paris alignment. This is about making our portfolios and our assets aligned uh, and helping to deliver the Paris uh, Agreement. It's great to see the work of the Finance for Tomorrow, um, particularly the work you've been doing looking at different stakeholders, the Investor Engagement uh, Alliance. Uh, just yesterday uh, in the UK, uh, we launched uh, the report of the Finance and Just Transition Alliance, which is about 40 uh, institutions, uh, investors, but also banks, uh, social finance organisations, trade unions, regional groups and so on. And I think that echoed a number of the points you've heard, the importance of strong policy frameworks, so investors advocating for strong policy frameworks to just transition, um, the, the role for shareholder engagement, and this is generating results uh, in terms of action, for example, the UK utility uh, SSE, uh, but also uh, results with uh, French uh, corporates such as EDF and so on. I think, uh, as you probably heard from Sarah, there's a need for real assets and capital allocation and the UK's green sovereign bond, which obviously came later than the, the French sovereign bond, but had the innovation of uh, explicitly identifying the social co-benefits from green spending. Um, and this all needs to be focused on place, as, we, as we've heard. Internationally, I think Just Transition is moving into the investor mainstream, as you probably heard, with the Climate Action 100+, plus, uh, the World Benchmarking Alliance, and so on. And a cop, I think we'll see a sort of many things around this, which will help to bring this agenda together. Um, the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, which is a CEO-led uh, group uh, with CEOs from major energy, energy companies, uh, BP and so on, working with the Vatican will be uh, producing its corporate framework for the Just Transition, which I think is quite a important development uh, in the sense that the Just Transition has been picked up obviously by investors. Uh, it's also been led by trade unions and policymakers. 
But I think now that businesses start to get serious about net zero, they realize they need to deal with the human and people dimensions. So that's going to be one development. Um, and expectations are that ministers will agree a just transition de declaration as well. So we had one in 2018 uh, uh, when we had the, the meeting in Poland. And I think there will be a, um, a declaration as well. So again, the political uh, signal. So just maybe a few thoughts going uh, forward, um, sort of seven areas. And just uh, for my benefit, maybe for yours, uh, all these priorities start with the letter P. Um, so the first, obviously, is about people. Uh, today is the launch of the IA's Global Commission on People-Centred Clean Energy Transitions. And I think we should recognise that nearly all our action on climate change is about people. Needs to be, and people need to be put at the heart of this. We have a false separation often between environmental and social issues. So that's, that's the first priority. Secondly, plans. A lot of the work around climate is now crystallizing on the need for companies, uh, businesses, but also financial institutions to have net zero plans. And what was very clear in the opening session of the, net zero, the Just Zero conference yesterday was the need for just transition to be embedded in these plans. And again, that's very consistent with the work of the Climate Action 100 Plus. The third P is persuasion, uh, otherwise known as, uh, as engagement. I think we're seeing the beginnings of, of engagement, particularly in the energy sectors, uh, oil and gas, um, mining, uh, utilities, and so on. Um, but I think also there's engagement that can be done by debt investors as well. Um, and I would suggest that many investors might want to engage with the banks they own um, on just transition, because banks are potentially really important actors, particularly in terms of financing small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, so that's the third P, persuasion. Uh, product, uh, again, we need to have particular product for investors. Uh, we need assets and funds that investors can allocate capital to. I think there's a lot of potential in terms of tr the transition finance theme uh, and making sure that the social dimension is fully uh, integrated there. And also more, more funds. And it's great to see Amundi launching their just transition bond fund, but we need more of these. Um, so that's the fourth product. Place has come up a lot, the territorial dimension of, of this. The transition happens in uh, real places. Um, and I think this is where real assets can come into their own, real estate, uh, private equity, private debt, infrastructure, and so on. And also, I think we talk a lot about the energy transition, but maybe we need to think about the biodiversity and nature uh, transition as well, the rural uh, communities and, and so on. That's where far more workers are than in the energy sector, potentially a, a billion people around the world one way linked uh, to the rural uh, economy. And, and uh, social conditions often uh, really quite, quite poor. So I think as well as just zero, we need to think about just uh, nature. So that's number five place. And then, uh, obviously, we need to think about uh, place in a different way, which is developing countries. Um, and we, we heard uh, about uh, Kenya. We just finished our Just Zero session on uh, emerging markets. So these are the pays en voie de développement. So that's the P. Uh, and this is where the, will be the real test of, of the Just Transition, where we need a real scale up. Um, not only do we need developed countries to meet uh, their 100 billion commitments, but this needs to be doubled by 2025 with particular allocations uh, for Just Transition. In many ways, we have this old lexicon of mitigation uh, adaptation, but actually in terms of early phase out of fossil fuel assets and respecting the, the workers and communities that are associated with that, that is not part of traditional climate finance. It needs to be, uh, and we need to have particular allocations on that. And there'll be lots of very interesting announcements of COP uh, from that. And the seventh is then uh, partnerships. And I think we've heard from great partnerships here uh, today. Um, the Just Transition is a team sport. It requires radical collaboration between different groups, often unusual allies, trade unions working with investors, investors working with community groups, uh, and community groups working with governments. So I think that's an area of collaboration. Uh, and certainly in the UK, with our Financing and Just Transition Alliance, I think there's been a lot of uh, momentum generated through that. Uh, and Pierre, I think it would be very good to see potential collaborations at, across Europe at different uh, initiatives. So I hope to see more partnerships with your work in, in France and potentially with other countries across Europe. So thank you very much. And just to close, um, really highlighting that uh, Just Transition is not an addendum. It's not the afterthought. It's really a critical factor for making sure we achieve uh, climate success. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Nick, for your brilliant conclusion and uh, what an inter interesting proposition uh, to to have to converge our uh, our um, coalitions and activities. Uh, we must converge to meet the ambition of the challenges of the just, just transition. So the session is now over. We we don't have any Q and A, but uh, but we we can stay in, uh, stay uh, connected. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for all the participants uh, for the quality of our debate also online and physically the session is only a step toward the COP26, the debates of which uh, I invite you to follow. And now I, I give the floor to our MC, Noam, <laughs> and uh, have a very nice day. Oh.